<clears throat> Hi, Armando. Hello, you there? Sarah? Ah, it's working today. Hey. <clears throat> oh, wait, hold on. How are you? I'm doing well. Yourself? I'm doing well as well. I, I didn't know if the camera was going to work, so I didn't put my light on, but let me fix that in a second. <laughs> Yay. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. What type of camera do I use? Do I have, mm -hmm. can I do multiple choices here? So <laughs> you don't have camera. to answer if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's cool that they do this. It's always interesting to see. Are, are you at the store? I am. Ah, I'm in excellent. Little Rock. Oh, yes. excellent. It's my first, my first overnight trip. Is like, it? Mm-hmm. I yeah, am so I'm, in the I'm in the classroom. I'm in the classroom of the store, and mm -hmm. we have like a little, like oh, you can't tell because of the background, but we have like a little theater. Like I'm projecting the webinar and stuff. It's it's kind of cool. It's been a little slow today, but I'm hopeful. We still got time. <laughs> Are so. there people actually walking into the store? Oh, it is. It's been pretty slow. Okay, there's but, been a few people, but, but not a ton. But they're allowing. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma is open. Yeah, not us. We're still close. Yeah, I know. Y'all are still super locked down. Two more weeks, I think. We think. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. For sure. For um, sure. Change the temperature on that light. I'm a little magenta. Mm -hmm. So how does it feel to be back on the road? It's kind of weird, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I like it. I'm happy to be on the road, but it's definitely like, it's a very, uh, I don't know. I've just never had to like, be so careful. Yeah. So it's very interesting. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I have another. Now I guess I have another overnight trip in like two weeks. Back wow. for another Bedford event in Oklahoma. So, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. 
it's been interesting. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm jealous because um, let me tell you, it's um, going stir crazy. Uh, I'm beyond stir crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I don't. I can't even. You know, think of a word for it. It's, uh, yeah. So let me open the door and let You're a mentally more. collapsing. Yeah, I I don't even know how I'm going to react <laughs> when when they say, okay, go to, you know, wherever and do this. Say, huh? How do I do that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I might I might need to I might need a tech for something in Austin at the end of the month. So. Well, hey, I am ready. <laughs> if I if I. Stay, well, I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to open the door and get some more light in here. <laughs> Well, hello, early birds. I see a few of you. Oh, Jeff. Oh, man, you don't count. <laughs> hey, Jeff. All righty. How are you, Jeff? You just hang in today? Oh, weird. Well, I'm glad you're able to get in. I'm gonna have a snack. Nice. <laughs> Thank you again for earlier. Your class was awesome. Um, I'm not sure we might, someone from Bedford's might be joining. I'm not totally sure. Um, if not, then I'll just do intro, do some housekeeping, and then pass it over. Okay. We'll probably start like five after, because a lot of people will probably start rolling in right at uh, two. Sounds good. I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat>
Okie dokie. I just didn't want everyone to watch me eat a protein bar on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Super exciting, I know. Well, it looks like we have quite a few early birds. Um, if you're just tuning in, welcome. If you can go ahead and answer the poll, I'm just curious to know what kind of systems you're using. Um, and let us know in the chat uh, where you're tuning in from. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. I forgot to ask, is this an hour? Mm -hmm. It's an hour uh, class? Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's fine. Our next one's at four. So, I mean, okay. if you want to so, go longer, you can. So there's a little time. Okay. Whatever you're comfortable with. All right. Yep. <clears throat> as long as you wrap up by like 3.30 or so, so I can get the other room ready. Oh, no problem. I just want to, you know, want to see how much of the accessories I should cover. But uh, if we've got that much time, I'll... For sure. I'll I will discuss that. Oh, yeah, 60 minutes to 90, 60 minutes, whatever, whatever works is good for me. And I'm assuming you can see my screen now? Yep, you are all good. Cool. All good, sir. Oh, got 19 people so far. Probably, a bunch will probably come in right at two. So it's uh, all Tamron day today, right? Yeah, we did a, uh... hi Janet, long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> She's in the chat. Um, yeah, we're doing a takeover for Bedford, so webinars all day long. Um, Jonathan Thorpe is up next at four and yeah then we're running sales all day or all week really um so <clears throat> sounds good <clears throat> yeah. so how are uh, sales out there uh, pretty good pretty good okay. so this part of this part of the country in general is is pretty uh pretty open and active so it's been besides some changes it feels like business as usual to an extent <laughs> okay i know it's it's very different how it's it's very interesting how it's so different in every part of the country so all right so if you're just tuning in um if you're able to answer our Oh, I'm sorry, what? Why don't you go ahead? Oh, if you're just tuning in and you can answer the poll questions, that would be awesome. Just curious to know what you guys are using. I was going to say I was just able to get a haircut three weeks ago. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was it was looking very shabby. <laughs> that's how my dad, uh, I mean, technically that stuff's open in Texas, but my dad has not gone to get his haircut yet. And keep in mind, he's like, completely bald up here uh -huh. he has just like scruff around here but i was over there last week and we put his hair in a ponytail <laughs> the first time he has like a straight up like mullet going on with the bald on top it's actually it's hilarious 
<laughs> so he's just like he now that it's this long he's like i'm just gonna keep it growing because whatever he's working from home and he's never on camera for anything so it, like it literally doesn't matter it's quite funny <laughs> that's funny so he's got a reverse mullet going on yeah <laughs> Alrighty, so it is two o'clock. Um, we'll get everything started, uh, maybe about five after. Um, so in just a few minutes, I'll do an intro, but if you're just tuning in, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, go ahead and answer the poll if you have not already. I'm just curious on, I can't see your answers, it's all anonymous. I'm just, just curious to see what everyone's shooting with. Um, and let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. If you're in the Little Rock area, I am currently at Bedford's in Little Rock. Um, I'll be here till close, so come on by because I have lenses and stuff for you to check out. New Braunfels, cool. I'm from Austin. San Francisco, very nice. Tulsa, cool. Springfield, Missouri, very cool. Texarkana, I'm gonna be driving through Texarkana tomorrow. I've never been through Texarkana. It's funny, I actually, I live in Fort Worth right now and I realize that Little Rock is on I-30 and I basically live off I-30 in Fort Worth. So I just drive on the same highway for five hours and I'm gonna drive directly through Texarkana, so. I've never seen it. Minnesota, Oklahoma City, South Carolina, very cool. Fort Smith. Good deal. Just away from a minute. Yeah, you're good. Ah, yes. I love floating in New Braunfels. Oh my gosh, I haven't done that in years. I love that though. I actually went, I got my degree, uh, my BFA from Texas State. So floating the river in San Marcos and New Braunfels was like every weekend. <laughs> if San Marcos was closer to Austin, like, by like 10, 15 minutes, I would probably still live there. I love that place so much because of the river. <laughs> oh, interesting. I didn't realize it was shut down. I mean, that would totally make sense. Everything's on lockdown. Alrighty. Well, it's 2.02, so I'm just gonna start doing some housekeeping um, before we get started. Hi from Ireland. Oh, so cool. What time is it in Ireland right now? I'm excited for you because this is going to be a good one. Thank you for joining us, Mert. Alrighty. So first and foremost, uh, my name is Sarah. I know it says Sean, but I'm not Sean. <laughs> my name is Sarah. I am the sales rep for Tamron USA. I cover Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, um, parts of Missouri. Uh, and I'm so stoked to be hanging with you guys. I am currently at the Bedford's location in Little Rock. So if you're in the area and you want to check out some lenses, ask me some questions, I am here. Um, I have gear for you to try out. Uh, if you happen to be in the market for a new lens or you see something that you're interested in, um, I do want to let you guys know that we are offering some special pricing that is exclusive to Bedford's 
it starts today and actually goes through the end of the week. So you get anywhere between $25 to $50 off. Uh, this includes some of our, even our new Sony lenses, like the 28 to 200 and the 70 to 180. You can save $25 on those. It is a mail-in rebate, um, but before you groan at that, um, it's like the easiest, quickest thing ever. It comes back in just a few weeks and it's a check, so it's not like some Visa card that takes like, you know, months to gain, <laughs> to get back, I promise. Um, so yeah, uh, if you haven't answered the poll yet, if you would please answer and then let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, any news on a 150 to 600 for Sony? Nope. I have no idea. We did just announce a 70 to 300 for Sony. We announced it on Friday. Um, I haven't received my sample yet. I'm hopeful to get it next week, but by the looks of it, it is teeny tiny. Uh, does Tamron plan to make any Fuji X-mount lenses? At this time, I do not know. It would be great. Many of us on the Tamron team are certainly Fuji fans. I've owned quite a few Fuji systems. I still have an X100. <laughs> so... It would be nice, but I have no clue at this time. San Antonio, hi. All righty. Well, um, one other thing I just want to make note of is this is our second to last webinar of the day. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, if you're free at 4 p.m., I highly, highly, highly recommend you tune in for Jonathan Thorpe's webinar. This is not your typical webinar. This is going to be him live on a set doing a photo shoot. You'll be watching over his shoulder, seeing how he works with models, how he works with the light, how he creates his scene. Um, he's more of a cinematic portrait photographer, so it's not just going to be any old portrait. It's going to be basically storytelling. Um, it's going to be awesome. I'm not going to reveal what his uh, his plan is, but it's it's going to be it's going to be pretty epic. Um, go ahead and. Go to the link. I will drop the link in the chat. Um, make sure you're registered for it. Even if you can't attend, you'll get sent a recording later. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be cool. You're going to feel like you are literally standing behind him on a set. So tune on in. Um, and without further ado, I want to introduce Armando Flores out of LA, and he's going to be teaching you all about nighttime photography. So thank you for joining, Armando. Thanks, Sarah. I really appreciate that. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Armando Flores. Uh, like Sarah said, uh, I am a tech rep for Tamron USA. Have been for just over six years now. And uh, but before then, I mean, I've been in the tech, uh, you know, in the uh, photo industry for many, many years. Before Tamron, I did uh, spend five years at Sony, uh, also as a tech rep in tech and sales. And before Sony, I actually spent 22 years at Nikon. So I've been around a little bit. Um, I love all sorts of photography. Um, I mean, I started, uh, I, you know, I, uh, excuse me, I, I um, studied photojournalism in college. Never really practiced it because when I was going to college, I got a job at Nikon. So never really worked in that industry. But uh, I did get to photograph uh, professional sports for about 17 years, then some Hollywood stuff. Uh, I, again, I've done just about every type of photography. But yeah, one of the types of photography that I always found interesting but never really did was night sky photography. Um, you know, Milky Way and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I figure out, it looks simple enough, I'm pretty sure I can do it. Went out there the first time and failed miserably. Uh, I just didn't know exactly what the settings should be for that. But anyway, uh, we will go ahead and share that stuff with you today and hopefully get you out there and take some awesome pictures. Uh, so anyway, uh, once again, uh, welcome. And uh, we are going to cover a few things. And just like anything, uh, your camera is a tool and it's very important to know how to use it so that you can get the most out of it. So we will talk about uh, camera settings, uh, camera controls, uh, you know, what to pack when you travel for uh, a particular shoot or an event or, you know, night sky photography in this case. A uh, little bit of uh, composition, we will talk about that. And then we're going to go ahead and give you some tips on, you know, uh, night photography. 
<clears throat> so let's go ahead and start with the night skies. And um, basically, um, night skies uh, are referred to, or night sky photography is referred to when you're photographing stars or the Milky Way. And there's various types of, uh, you know, photographs that you can capture while doing that. Uh, but usually, I mean, I've been to many national parks in the past, uh, you know, seven, eight years. And one thing that I found is that um, you are always going to be surrounded by several of your closest friends that you don't know yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, don't fret. I mean, you know, uh, your photographs are going to be different than the person standing next to you. Uh, just because, uh, you know, you're standing in the same spot doesn't mean that you're going to get the same exact shot. Uh, they may be using a different focal length. They may be using, uh, you know, a different technique. Who knows? But, um, you know, uh, just get out there and have some fun. That's what I always say. So let's go ahead and jump into uh, camera controls. Now, we are all very familiar with this dial mode on top of the camera. And uh, the one that you're, the, the modes that you're going to be, you know, using mostly for night sky photography is going to be the manual mode. Uh, so you are, uh, you know, you do need to be familiar with uh, how to set your exposure in manual. And there are obviously three factors that control or contribute to exposure, uh, and they are the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. So we're going to break those down one at a time and uh, go through them really quickly. So your aperture is basically the amount of light that you are allowing to come through the lens. That is what aperture is in the simplest form. But what you're actually doing is you are controlling uh, how much or what part of your photo is in focus. You are controlling the depth of field. Now there is a camera setting on your dial that says A. A is for aperture priority. Now aperture priority is a semi-automated mode. In other words, you are allowed to set the aperture, but the camera is going to control the shutter speed. So for night sky photography, when you're photographing stars, the Milky Way, uh, maybe a cityscape, or fireworks, that mode really doesn't work. Uh, it works for everything else, for portraiture, for macro, uh, landscape, that kind of stuff. Aperture priority is great. So uh, for the most part, you'll be uh, controlling the uh, depth of field manually uh, using the um, aperture ring or the dial on your camera that controls the depth of field because sometimes what you want is you want everything to be in focus. So you're going to need a lot of depth of field and the way to achieve depth of field or a greater depth of field or deeper depth of field is to know exactly what you uh, need to control. So when you close the lens down or you use a smaller aperture, you're you're getting more depth of field. But there are also three other factors that uh, contribute to that. And it's very important to know what they are so that you can use those to your advantage. Uh, another one is going to be the focal length. In other words, the millimeter of the lens that you're using. The wider the angle of the lens, the more depth of field you're gonna gain as well. Uh, there's another factor and that's the proximity of the subject to the lens. So the closer the subject is to the lens, uh, the less depth of field you're going to have. The further away the subject is to the lens, the more depth of field you're going to gain. So remember that as well. And last but not least, there is one factor that nobody really talks about because it's already embedded in your camera, and that is the size of the imaging sensor in your camera, the size of the, of the uh, chip. So basically, the smaller the sensor, the more depth of field you're going to have. The larger the sensor, the shallower the depth of field becomes as well. So if you've ever taken a, a picture with your cell phone, and I'm sure you have, uh, you notice that every time you take a picture with a cell phone, everything seems to be in focus. That's because the cell phone has a very, very small sensor, and they usually couple that with a wide angle lens. So guess what? You're going to have a lot of depth of field, so everything is usually going to be in focus. So when you want to control depth of field, remember those four factors. 
Now, uh, when you open up your lens and you allow more light to come in, you are reducing the depth of field. So that's how you can make a an, an, uh, subject uh, separate from the background. Now, once again, I did mention that the closer you get to your subject, the shallower the depth of field becomes. Well, uh, when you're doing macro photography, uh, you are talking about depth of fields uh, that would you know, it's in millimeters. It's very, very, very shallow. So um, once again, you know, uh, remember those factors. So let's go ahead and jump to uh, shutter speed. Now shutter speed is also very simple. Shutter speed is the amount of time that you are allowing the light to come through the lens. Again, that is in his very basic uh, sense. Uh, what you are actually doing is you are controlling motion. Uh, with your shutter speed, you're either freezing a subject in midair or you're showing a little bit of movement. So when you want to do that, uh, there is an S mode on your camera dial and that is for shutter priority. Now for those of you using Canon cameras, uh, shutter priority is TV or time value. Aperture priority is AV or aperture value. <clears throat> Uh, so um, just remember that. Um, however, in shutter priority, if you want to freeze a subject, then you need to select a fast shutter speed. <clears throat> now, the faster the subject moves, the faster your shutter speed needs to be in order for you to freeze that movement. Uh, this example right here, uh, there's a uh, <clears throat> fly fisherman in the river and as he's casting, uh, his line backwards. We wanted to freeze that line as it went, <clears throat> as it went backwards. Uh, so in order to do that, we needed fast shutter speed, and that was about a two thousandth of a second in order to do that. But sometimes you want an image to be a little more dramatic. You want to show a little bit of movement, so you slow down your shutter speed. Now. How slow of a shutter speed really depends on how fast your subject is moving as well. So your shutter speed values will differ from one subject to the next. But anyway, here are some starting points for your shutter speed. Now, I do use shutter priority, uh, you know, quite often on my camera, uh, especially when I'm photographing moving subjects, um, shooting sports or some wildlife. Uh, I want to go ahead and just simply select the shutter speed. It is a semi-automated mode. So what that means is that the camera is going to set the aperture for me. So just remember that. But the beauty about those semi-automated modes is that you still have control over all of your other settings in your camera. So once again, here are some starting points for some shutter speeds. Now, uh, if your subject is motionless, not moving around at all, your shutter speed can be pretty slow. Uh, usually a 60th to a 125th of a second is good enough. Now, most of us uh, are usually able to handhold a camera in the lens at those shutter speeds. But uh, if you're using a longer focal length lens, a telephoto lens, for example, your shutter speeds need to be a little bit uh, faster so that when you're hand holding that camera in the lens, your movement from physically holding it is not being recorded. So once again, these are starting points, the faster, the better always. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the last, uh, the last setting would be the ISO. Now the ISO, once again, very simple, is your imaging sensors sensitivity to light. Now one thing I'll, I will mention is that all cameras have a native ISO and that's usually going to be a very slow ISO, uh, usually about 100. Some cameras start at two, but most of them start at 100. So your camera is designed to give you the optimal image at 100 ISO. As you increase your ISO number, you're actually turning up the gain on the imaging sensor so that it's able to record uh, light in, you know, in lower light situations. Uh, when you do that, however, what you do is you're increasing the noise. Uh, you know, back in the film days, we called it grain. Now we call it noise. It's uh, RGB dots or uh, red, green, and blue dots in the dark areas. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, what I usually do is when I get a new camera, I do an ISO test on my camera and I try to figure out what is the uh, highest ISO that I'm going to use with that camera or what do I find acceptable uh, for noise or 
as I call it, what is my tolerance for noise with that particular camera body? So I start at 800 and I take a picture at 800 ISO. Then I double that to 1632 and so on and so forth. I go as high as the camera uh, allows me to go. And then what I do is I actually make some prints. You can bring the images into the computer, but you really don't get a feel uh, or a sense of how, much, how noisy it is. But if you make a print, you do. So then I, I make some prints. I bring them back home, lay them all out. And then I pick that picture that I think it's, uh, you know, uh, too grainy, then I select the ISO below that. So when I did my last test, I figured that 6400 was too grainy for me. I decided 3200 was acceptable. So guess what? My camera never goes above 3200 ISO. And that's just simply the way I, I you know, I do it. So when you have plenty of light and or you're on a tripod and you're capturing certain types of images, uh, the slower the ISO, the better. Uh, the lowest ISO, once again, is going to give you the most detail. Um, but sometimes you may be in a situation where the light level is a uh, lower and you're not on a tripod, you're hand holding. So what you need to do is you need to raise up the ISO so that you can get faster shutter speeds where you can now physically hand hold that camera lens. This particular case, we're in the river, we're right in the middle of the river, no tripod, just physically hand holding it. So uh, I know that with this particular lens uh, at a certain focal length, that I need a certain shutter speed. How do you figure that out? Well, you go out there and you play with your equipment. Uh, you do tests. Uh, every time we get a new lens, what I do is I mount the lens on the camera and then I try to see how slow of a shutter speed I can use while hand holding and still get a sharp image. Uh, for the most part, I'll start at a 60th of a second and then I'll slow it down from there and I'll go as slow as I can go. And whenever you are in a semi-automated mode and the camera is setting the uh, uh, shutter speed for you, like an aperture priority, now you know that uh, if it sets a shutter speed that is too slow for that focal length, that you need to do something. And that something is probably going to be A, open up your lens to allow more light so you get a faster shutter speed or raise your ISO if you can't, uh, you know, open up the lens anymore or you don't want to lose that depth of field. And that is the way exposure works. It's all intertwined. If you add to one, you must take away from one of the other two or both in the opposite direction. Once you grasp that, it's actually very simple. You can take pictures uh, anywhere. You can take pictures of a bat in a cave. So uh, <clears throat> just uh, remember that when you make a change uh, to one of those, you need to make a change to one of the other two. That is where manual mode comes in. Uh, now, manual mode, once again, you are controlling all of the three factors, so just keep that in mind. Now, sometimes there is a little bit of light to aid you, but it is still pretty dark. So here we have the moon actually illuminating uh, the scene for us. Now, it doesn't look like there's a lot of light, but if you put your camera uh, on a tripod or on a ledge or on something very sturdy, you raise up your ISO just a little bit to retain, uh, all, you know, that uh, detail so it doesn't get too, uh, too noisy and you slow down your shutter speed considerably. We're talking a few seconds at that, this point. We won't be able to hand hold it. That's why tripod or some ledge or something uh, very sturdy. Then you can record that light that is reflecting uh, off the scenery from the moon. And basically this is a moonlit shot. So uh, once again, uh, higher ISOs are necessary for this type of photography. Now, which brings us to night sky photography, the Milky Way, the stars. Now, if you want your uh, stars and the Milky Way as a pinpoint light source, there is a very specific formula that you have to use uh, it, to enable you to take, to take and capture pictures uh, such as this. And um, that is the 500 rule. That's what we call it. Um, so basically, with the 500 rule, it requires that you set your camera to 3200 ISO. And uh, here's, here's the formula for you basically. And basically what it is, is that um, 
what you do is you decide what focal length of the lens you're going to use. You then take the focal length and you divide 500 by the focal length, and that gives you a fraction uh, of uh, a fraction number. That number is actually the shutter speed that you can use. You can use a slower shutter speed, uh, no problem. But if you use a uh, excuse, uh, yeah, you, if if you use a uh, a uh, faster shutter speed, then then you're going to get uh, an, an erroneous reading. So basically, here's what happens. If I'm uh, photographing the Milky Way and I'm using a 15 mill millimeter lens, I have to buy 500 by 15 and it gives me 33.33333, you know, to infinity. Uh, but there on my uh, shutter dial, there is a 30 second exposure setting. So the difference between 30 seconds and 33.333 is not a big deal. So I set it to 30 seconds and there you go. Um, if you are using a 20 millimeter lens, now your setting is going to be, you know, the math gives you 25 seconds. Um, and if you use a 24, you get 20.333, you, you get the idea. Uh, if you can use a corresponding shutter speed that is slower, it's good but if it's faster, you can. So anyway, that is the way the formula works. And uh, it actually makes things very simple. Now there is a setting uh, or a feature on your lens and it's called VC. We call it VC, it's image stabilization, uh, VR for other companies, uh, steady shot for others uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, image stabilization, uh, basically it's a mechanism inside your lens that uh, puts one lens element on a set of motors. And it, when you're hand holding the camera and the lens, uh, you are actually physically moving you, even if you think you're not. And what this does is that the motors will move that lens element in the opposite direction to compensate for the movement. This allows you to use either slower shutter speeds uh, than you normally would uh, or uh, use longer telephoto lenses and physically handhold them. There is a rule out there that tells you that um, if you're physically handholding the lens, your shutter speed should equal the focal length of the lens that you're handholding. So for example, if you're holding a 500 millimeter lens, your shutter speed needs to be about a 500th of a second. Once again, the faster the better. But uh, some of us may have or may be using um, crop sensor cameras, you know, those uh, DSLR cameras with the sensor that is smaller than, uh, than a full frame. This, all this information comes from, um, you know, from back in the day, the, uh, you know, the rule was, or the standard back then was uh, 35 millimeter film. So everything we talk about in focal lengths and shutter speeds, it's always being referred to that standard. So if you have a camera that has a sensor or an imaging sensor that is the same size as a 35 millimeter piece of film, it's a full frame sensor. It's a, you know, standard, uh, you know, setting or a standard measurement. Um, if you are using a camera that has a sensor that is smaller than that, then it's considered a crop sensor. So you're viewing a cropped in section of that full frame sensor. And now you have to do a uh, <clears throat> multiplication. So is what we call the crop factor. Uh, if you're using a Nikon, a Fuji, a Sony, a Pentax, a Leica, uh, the the uh, crop sensor cameras are usually an APS-C size sensor and that crop factor is 1.5. So whatever lens you mount on it, you multiply that by 1.5. If you're using a Canon, it, it's also an APS-C size sensor. However, it's just a smidge smaller. So the crop factor is 1.6. So math is, is a little bit difficult, a little more uh, different with the uh, Canon. Uh, however, and, and the reason this is important is that is because if you're physically hand holding a 500 millimeter lens on a crop sensor camera, you multiply that by the crop factor. If it's a Canon, uh, it's a 1.6. If it's a Nikon, it's 1.5, a Sony 1.5. So on those cameras, your shutter speed should be closer to a 750th of a second. And that's why that's important. However, uh, if you have your lens mounted on a tripod and you're doing long exposures, longer than a quarter second, uh, guess what? You need to turn the VC off. So uh, all of this is just for handholding uh, your images. And 
sometimes you get put in situations where A, you don't have a tripod, B, you didn't bring a tripod, or you're not allowed to have, have one, uh, then what do you do? Well, if you want to take pictures, you're going to have to do what you can with what you've got. This particular case, um, Slot Canyon in Antelope Valley, uh, you can't bring a tripod, but in order to capture the image and not use a very high ISO, your shutter speeds are pretty low. In this case, it's an eighth of a second. So most of us may not be able to handhold it. So what do you do? You slow down your shutter speed to uh, what you need to put it and physically brace the camera on the side or on something so that you are able to use a slower uh, shutter speeds. And you turn on your VC and hopefully uh, you get uh, the results that you're looking for. So let's go ahead and uh, move on and let's go and talk about what do we put in our camera bag? Well, once again, that really depends on what you're doing photographically or where you're traveling to or what your needs are going to be. So if you have a, an, an APS-C size sensor camera, there are lenses specifically designed for those cameras. And uh, you know, so if I'm gonna do some landscape, some night sky photography, I'm probably gonna take a 10 to 24, a 17 to 50, uh, or maybe even uh, an 18 to 400. If I have a full, uh, full frame camera, uh, then I've got uh, choices that are 15 to 30, 24, 70. Um, if I'm taking a mirrorless, it's gonna be a 17 to 28, a 28 to 75. And uh, I'm always going to carry a prime lens with me. And the reason is prime lenses are usually large aperture or what we call fast lenses. They have uh, a very large aperture enabling you to use those lenses in lower light situations uh, without having to uh, you know, elevate your ISO to get the faster shutter speeds. And that's the way that goes. Uh, so usually when I go to a Tamron event, uh, guess what? I usually carry one of each cameras, an APS-C, a full frame, and a mirrorless, and then assorted lenses for those uh, cameras. Uh, once again, depending on what I'm, what I'm doing, but it's usually going to be uh, zoom lenses. And the reason is if I went with prime lenses, I would probably have to carry uh, double or triple the amount of lenses that I would if I, you know, if I didn't carry a zoom. So there you go. Uh, tripod. Yes, uh, if I'm going to do some low light stuff, I always carry a tripod. Uh, if I'm going to do some landscapes or portraiture, uh, usually not, but uh, you know, very necessary for night sky photography. Batteries, uh, you will, you know, after shooting for a while, uh, or if you're shooting in very cold conditions, uh, you'll learn that the batteries may get exhausted pretty quickly. Some cameras are more power hungry than others. So learn to see how many images or how long you can shoot with a camera and that'll determine how many extra batteries you're gonna need. Uh, memory cards, uh, you know, they're so cheap now, uh, you know, carry a <clears throat> extra two or three in your bag, you know. Uh, filters, uh, not for nice sky photography, but for landscapes and everything else, sure. Uh, cable release, something to fire the camera uh, remotely so that you don't physically have to touch it. Uh, very necessary, once again, because you're dealing with uh, very slow shutter speeds. And then a flashlight or headlamp, uh, you want to see where you're walking once you're finished, but the flashlights serve a you know, another purpose as well. So, and we'll talk about it in a second. So this is what uh, Erica's bag looks like. And, uh, you know, she's small, she's petite, she's 4'11", and she really couldn't find a camera bag that really, uh, you know, suit her, you know, suit her needs. So what she did is she went and bought an off the rack, uh, you know, backpack, and then she modified and made it, uh, you know, uh, her camera bag. And, you know, this is what she did. But obviously there are camera bags out there, backpacks and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, do a little research if you are looking for one of these and, uh, you know, you don't want one that's way too big because trust me, you're gonna tend to want to fill it and then it becomes really heavy. I started with a very large uh, bag 
backpack, I was able to fit even a 400 millimeter 2.8 lens in that backpack. Uh, yes, but uh, it weighed about 55 pounds. You don't want to carry that uh, all day. So, um, you know, figure out what you want to take. Um, the most equipment you're going to carry, probably two cameras, uh, extra accessories, maybe three or four lenses. So medium sized bag is probably what I would recommend. Anyway, there are some uh, tips. If you are going to be doing some uh, night sky photography that requires very slow uh, shutter speeds, there are a few things that you'll need to, um, you know, learn or bring with you. Uh, so first of all, uh, settings. In very dark sky situation, the camera's autofocus system does not work. So you're going to have to focus manually. So, uh, you know, get familiar with this. Uh, practice at home before you go uh, and uh, see how or which direction you need to turn the lens to get you to the furthest, uh, you know, distance or to the infinity mark. Um, because uh, when you're doing night sky photography, uh, some lenses don't even have an infinity mark on them. That's why you need to learn which direction to turn. You'll find that the most difficult thing uh, in night sky photography is focusing in the dark. You're focusing on a very, very small star that's very far away in the distance. And it's, uh, you know, very difficult to do. So when you do this, you probably only want to do this once. Once you achieve your focus, then you can take a piece of gaffer's tape and then place it over the lens barrel and the focusing ring so that you don't accidentally move it while you're taking pictures. If you have a zoom lens, you're going to tend to zoom in and out. You don't want to grab the focus ring and then get you out of focus. Then you're going to have to start all over again. And believe me, it is uh, probably the most difficult thing to do in night sky photography. So in order to help you focus on a very, very small star, uh, what uh, I recommend you do is if you have a camera that has a live view setting, turn on the live view setting and then magnify it so it's as large as possible. So your subject is as large as possible. Then find the brightest star uh, or planet in the sky and focus manually on it. Once you've done that and you're happy with uh, your focusing, then you tape it down and you're good for the rest of the night. Now, um, another thing, uh, like I said, another accessory that you want is a cable release or a shutter release of some kind. Now, if it has a cable or a cord, uh, one thing you don't want to do is trip over it uh, while you're moving around. So again, a little piece of tape on the tripod leg or, uh, you know, somewhere will help you with that and, uh, you know, uh, save you some grief. Uh, if you have one of the wireless uh, uh, cable releases, then, you know, obviously you don't have to worry about that. Now, there, uh, you know, a tripod is very necessary. Uh, you know, the thicker the legs, the better uh, the results are going to be. When I go out and do night sky photography, the one thing that I don't take with me is a travel tripod. Travel tra tripods are very good when you're doing uh, landscape, maybe some portraiture, maybe some macro, but when you're dealing with very slow shutter speeds, sometimes 30 seconds or, you know, something like that, or if you're doing star trails, you're going to be talking about minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, or who knows. Uh, you want the most sturdiest tripod possible. So, um, you know, just uh, remember that. And, uh, you know, do a little research. Uh, know what you want to shoot before you get there. Uh, if you don't know exactly where you want to position yourself, then get there a little bit earlier uh, where you can still see, uh, you know, the surroundings and, uh, you know, get a, get an idea of where you're going to be and what direction, so on and so forth. Uh, so um, if you are going to be photographing uh, the Milky Way, uh, your white balance, uh, you may want to set that manually. You can turn your white balance uh, selection to the K or the Kelvin setting, and then you can turn it down anywhere between 3200K and 3400K seems to work best. 
Uh, so, you know, play with that and, um, and see uh, what your results are. Now for night sky photography, you're going to want longer focal length, I mean, excuse me, you're going to want wider angle lenses. Uh, once again, lenses of choice for me are going to be the wide angle zooms. Uh, so full frame uh, lenses would be a 15 to 30, a 17 to 35, 24 to 70. Uh, crop sensor, uh, 10 to 24 or 17 to 50. And then mirrorless would be uh, 17 to 28 at this point that is what uh, we have. There's also a 20 millimeter uh, 2.8 uh, that you can use for mirrorless as well and this would be Sony mirrorless. Now the good thing about a full frame lens is that you can use it on an APS-C size sensor camera but you can't use an APS-C size sensor lens on a full frame camera. The, um, the exit uh, ring on the back uh, the image circle is just not large enough to cover the full frame. So just be aware of that. Okay, so um, now this is what you would get with a 15 millimeter lens. Uh, as you can see, you're going to get a lot more of the night sky. You're going to get a lot more of the Milky Way. So usually the wider the angle, uh, the better the results are going to be if that is the type of photography you're going to do. 24 millimeter lens is probably at the very top of the wide angle that I would ever use for nice sky photography uh, because it does limit you uh, somewhat. And then a telephoto lens, well, those are just simply uh, out of the question. You're just going to get a very small segment of the sky and, uh, you know, probably not what you want to do. Now remember that flashlight that you packed? Well, it does, like I said, have a uh, different use. And one of those uses uh, is that you can use it for light painting. So basically you would set up your exposure just like you would uh, uh, with that formula. So the 500 rule. Okay, so if I'm using a 15 millimeter lens on here, which I am, uh, my shutter speed is set manually to a uh, 30 seconds. Uh, my aperture is set at 2.8. Uh, with that formula, it requires that the max, the aperture set to the maximum at 2.8. And then my uh, ISO is set to 3200. And all I did here was simply add a little bit of light with that flashlight underneath that arch. Now, your results are going to vary depending on how much power the flashlight has. And uh, once again, what the color temperature is of that flashlight as well. Now, I do prefer to use flashlights that I can regulate the color temperature. They do exist. Basically, you can set the Kelvin temperature anywhere from uh, 3000 K to about 55 or 5600 K. Now, each flashlight is going to be a little bit different. So take a look at those and see uh, which one is best because now what I can do is that if I have my um, white balance set to 3200 Kelvin, I can set the light for the same temperature so everything's going to be the same. So if I want to change the uh, temperature of the flashlight, the uh, the light painting light is going to be a different color. Now you may want to get creative so that it would be a, an alternative or a choice for you. So another example of light painting and uh, you know this is uh, once again night sky and uh, just a little bit of light uh, on your subject. Now what happens if you don't uh, bring a flashlight with you? Uh, well you know maybe you can use another light source. Now, this is light painting with the headlights of a car. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit hot or a little bit overexposed, uh, but uh, if you turn them off uh, for less period of time, your results, once again, are going to vary with how long you leave those lights on. So maybe you wanna try your hand at star trails. Okay, so this requires uh, different settings uh, here you're going to want to use a uh, low ISO, uh, maybe a native ISO of 100 or maybe a maximum ISO of 400. 
and uh, uh, your aperture, well, you're going to want, uh, a, you know, a lot of depth of field for these particular shots. So maybe F8, F11, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then your shutter speed, well, that really is going to depend on how much of a star trail you want to record. So if you want to record a very short, uh, you know, star trail, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, you want to record, uh, you know, a longer one will require a much longer time. This particular one was a 13 minute exposure. Now you can see that the stars are going in a circular pattern. Well, the only way to achieve this is to find Polaris or the North Star. Put that in the center, as you can see that in the very small speck in the center, that's Polaris. And then your uh, star trails are going to be in a circular motion. Okay, so you know, then what you can do is you can start playing with the amount of time that uh, you record your star trails uh, and you start playing with your composition as well. In this particular case, what we're doing is we're using the rule of thirds. Uh, as you can see, the horizon down at the bottom uh, third, and since there's a lot more happening in the sky, we leave a lot more room up there. Then we put uh, Polaris uh, in one of the uh, PowerPoints, which is on the top left, uh, to improve our composition. Okay, but you know, have a game plan um, and uh, go ahead and execute it. This particular case, we got there really early, walked around, figured out where we wanted to photograph, um, and we came back at night and we set up and took the shots. So game plan, execute the game plan, nice dirty tripod, uh, the uh, 500 rule, and uh, you know, um, but you know, something's missing. Okay, so we had all of that color here and this is what we got. So what do we do if we wanna bring it back? You guessed it, you get your flashlight out and add a little bit of light to that image uh, to bring that color back. So uh, again, composition, uh, things that you want to consider are um, leading lines, uh, a focal point, scale, uh, color, uh, and then your angle of, and your perspective. Is it going to be a low angle? Is it going to be a high angle? Uh, where are you gonna place your subject? So on and so forth, you start thinking about this. Okay, so let's go with the rule of thirds. And there you go. Um, you've got your subject near one of those intersecting lines. Uh, for those of you who don't know what rule of thirds is, uh, I'm sure we've all been bombarded with it, however, is you divide your uh, viewfinder or your scene into three sections, both horizontally and vertically. And where those lines intersect would be your PowerPoint. Uh, right here, what we have is we have our focal point, which is the, um, uh, the uh, structure uh, in the back overseen by the lake. Uh, we then frame it uh, with the branches of a tree uh, so that your eye or your viewer's eye is let right to where we want it to go, which is uh, our focal point. Uh, you can also use uh, leading lines to achieve that. A leading line could be a straight edge uh, of something where two things meet, uh, it, you know, the horizon or the uh, the path here uh, could be a leading line. Uh, leading lines can also be um, color. Uh, you have from light, uh, from dark to light, that could be used as a leading line as well. Also, uh, it's important when you're doing uh, some type of photography to add a little bit of scale sometimes uh, to help tell the story. This particular case, you've got two uh, uh, stones uh, leaning against each other. Uh, you know, taken at, uh, you know, at uh, very uh, dark night sky. And when you want to tell somebody, well, this is actually a pretty large stone uh, because you can achieve this with a wide angle lens, very wide angle lens, two small stones, you get very close together, makes everything look bigger, right? Uh, but when you add scale, you add that human element, something where we know how large a subject is. We all know that most people are around, I don't know, anywhere between five, you know, five, five and six feet somewhere. We, we have an idea of how tall a person is. When you add uh, 
you know, a person to the scene. Now you're adding scale to the uh, image. And when you add a human element to that uh, image, uh, once again, you uh, begin to see uh, or get an idea, your viewer begins to see, get an idea of how large that subject really is. Now, sometimes you may want to, uh, you know, shoot uh, for, for black and white. Uh, this particular case, uh, we were out in Arches National Park. Uh, there was a storm heading in our direction. We were shooting down in the valley uh, in the Arches, uh, having a good time. We saw the storm coming and we decided, well, what if we try to find a higher vantage point and let the storm pass right over us? Uh, well, the colors are going to be a lot muted and, uh, you know, a lot more subdued. However, for black and white, that's what you're looking for. So I always shoot uh, in raw. And when I shoot in raw, I always shoot in color. Because uh, if I shoot in JPEG and, you know, shoot for black and white or select black and white, guess what? You're never going to be able to put that color back. But in raw, it's very simple. You simply desaturate your image and, uh, you know, you can turn that image into black and white uh, once again very easily. So right here, we're also, you know, always thinking of composition. So we've got that human element down at the bottom right, uh, actually waited for about 30 minutes uh, for a vehicle to come down the road. Sometimes we got three. I didn't want three. Uh, sometimes we had a whole caravan out. That's not what I wanted. I wanted one lonely car right in that little uh, turnout as it got there. So waited patiently until that happened, press the button and there you go. Then put it in the computer and desaturate that image. And there you go. Now, sometimes uh, images will work better uh, in color than they do in black and white. But, you know, who's to say uh, in this particular case, um, you know, I think that uh, the black and white looks better. But anyway, that is my opinion. And there you go. So, you know, always looking anytime you're taking pictures, always looking at the composition. If you're photographing the Milky Way, you want the Milky Way uh, lined up so that it actually lands on something. It just gives it a little uh, better sense of scale, first of all, and it, you know, does um, make for a little better composition as well. A little bit of light painting, uh, and there you go. Sometimes you may not have the Milky Way in the picture, but you're still looking at your composition. And once again, you know, having a point where that Milky Way is going to come down and rest uh, is always very important when you're doing, uh, you know, uh, night sky photography. So, you know, once again, start with the game plan. Okay, get there early enough and, uh, you know, try to figure out where you're going to position yourself or where you're going to take pictures from. Um, there are uh, a lot of applications out there for night sky photography and you can get there during the day you can open up your app and it's going to tell you at a certain time in the evening you know you can 10 o'clock 11 12 whatever it's going to show you where the milky way is going to be uh once you you know once that time hits uh but you can see this during the day so you can select your vantage point or vantage points if you're going to move around and uh you know so execute your plan uh do your research a uh, little bit of light painting. Now, in this particular situation, there's no way I could get from where I'm pressing uh, the shutter release to the arch to light it and then, you know, do this all over again. Now, if I could, I'd be very, very tired at the end of the evening. But anyway, uh, sometimes you need uh, more than one person. So in this case, we're working as a team. Uh, one person firing off two cameras and the other person light painting. So, you know, you play with it, get creative, uh, figure out, uh, you know, does this image, uh, you know, work, look better horizontally or does it, does it look better vertically? You know, you decide. Uh, I always shoot both. Um, so I have that I don't have to decide. And then I've got many, many choices. I tend to do this. Uh, there's a little voice in the back of my head. Every time I go out shooting, you know, we've got two eyes horizontally and we look at the world uh, in, in that uh, format. Uh, however, you know, take three, four, five, six pictures horizontal and then flip your camera and take some uh, verticals. Uh, it might make a bigger difference. This case, uh, you know, it makes, in my opinion, for a, a you know, better image. 
And once again, just play with it, have some fun. Uh, so, you know, take out that flashlight. And if there's a little bit of uh, moisture in the sky, uh, guess what? You're going to see that uh, light beam. Uh, this particular case, we wanted a cooler beam. Uh, we didn't want to match the color temperature uh, of the sky that we were photographing. So there you go, you know, and uh, play with it and move around and do various things. So there are many different types of, uh, you know, night sky photography. Uh, maybe you're doing a cityscape. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, if you're going to do a cityscape, then your settings, once again, are totally different. You go to the native ISO, so ISO 100. Uh, you're going to need a tripod because your shutter speeds are going to be pretty slow. What you're going to do is uh, your apertures. Well, you're going to want a lot of depth of field. So F11, F16, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood is where you're going to be. 100 ISO, and then your shutter speed uh, is going to be in the seconds. This particular case, you can use aperture priority um, and see what results you get. Now, if uh, your results aren't what you know you want them to be, then you're going to, uh, if you're using a semi-automated mode, aperture priority or shutter priority, and you're doing this type of photography, um, and if your picture is too dark or too bright, you can always go to the exposure compensation dial or button and then add or subtract light depending on what you want to do. If you're doing this manually, uh, then it's very simple. Uh, you want your depth of field so you don't touch your aperture. Uh, you don't touch your uh, ISO either because you want as much detail as possible. So the slower the shutter speed you go, the more light you're going to add. The faster the shutter speed, the less light you're going to add. So that's how you lighten and darken your images in that type of photography. Well, let's say you're doing fireworks. Uh, you, you're at a fireworks show, it's the 4th of July or whatever the case may be. Now your exposure, once again, is going to be very similar to uh, the uh, sky, uh, the, you know, the sky scene or the uh, cityscapes. Um, your ISO, the native ISO 100 is going to be the best choice. Your aperture is going to be anywhere between F11 and F16. Now, if there's a lot of light in the sky, you want F16 to make the sky a little bit darker. And if there isn't, you can use F11. But anyway, uh, play with the two and see which one works best for you. Shutter speed is going to de be determined uh, by how many firework burst in the sky you want to record. So you time it basically. If fireworks are going off one second apart, so you know, one goes up, blows up, one second later, the next one goes up. And if you want to capture five, guess what? That's a five second exposure. And uh, it's as simple as that. And which brings us to uh, the moon. If you're going to be photographing the moon, uh, then your exposures once again are totally different. What is the moon? Well, the moon is, uh, uh, when we see the moon, is the sun reflecting off the moon is what we're seeing. So the exposure for the moon is actually uh, if you were taking pictures here on Earth during the day. And that's where you can use the sunny 16 rule as a guide. And the sunny 16 rule uh, simply tells you that in a bright sunny day, uh, uh, your aperture can be set to F16. And if you do that, then your shutter speed is going to equal the ISO that you've selected. So if you're going to photograph a full moon and it fills up a good portion of the frame, you could start at F16 at a 1 25th of a second at 100 ISO and see what your results are. Now, once again, uh, depending on the time of year and how high the moon is in the, uh, her over the horizon, it's going to determine that, uh, that exposure. Uh, what you can do is you can, um, speed up your shutter speed if you want uh, the moon a little darker or slow down your shutter speed if you want your moon a little bit brighter. This particular case, we're about F8 at about a uh, one hundredth of a second. And that's what the exposure was for this situation. For this situation, however, uh, F16 and about a hundredth of a second, that is where we ended up. Now, there are uh, other things that you're going to need, and we did touch on these a little bit. And once again, a good sturdy tripod for night nice sky photography. Now, what I always tell people is that look at the construction of the tripod 
and look at how many sections that tripod has and look at at the tripod and see if it has a center column or not. Uh, those are the most important things to me when I'm uh, selecting a tripod. And in fact, I am looking for my fourth tripod now. Um, so how many sections that tripod has will determine how sturdy that tripod is. You probably all seen those travel tripods that have like five sections. Well, if you've ever extended that very last section, the very small section, that leg, is, the, the girth of that leg is probably uh, thinner than my pinky. For night sky photography, when you're doing, you know, uh, exposures in the minutes, seconds or minutes, not very sturdy. Uh, so I would rather have a tripod with less sections because the last section is going to be thicker, uh, usually thicker than my thumb, and that's probably what I'm looking for. Construction of the legs, okay, so there's carbon fiber and there's aluminum. Uh, aluminum is going to be heavier, but it's also going to be cheaper. Uh, carbon fiber is going to be lighter, and it does absorb vibration better uh, but it's gonna be more expensive. That's uh, the thing I would consider. Uh, center column, well, the center column uh, allows you to raise the position of your camera just a little bit higher than the height of the tripod. This could be very helpful, but remember, the higher you raise that column, the less uh, stability you're going to have. So normally, you don't wanna raise the center column uh, higher than half of its actual length. Tripods with a center column can be useful uh, for other types of photography if it articulates or moves. Some tripods have the ability of taking that center column and then placing it horizontally. Guess what? Now you can use it for copy work uh, or for macro photography. So, you know, if that is your thought, uh, then maybe one of those is, uh, you know, good for you. Now, in my opinion, another part of the tripod that is very important is the ball head. And I would say put a little more emphasis on that uh, because it is very important. If you're going to do night sky photography, you're going to want a ball head that has as few controls as uh, possible because you're actually trying to do this all in the dark. And uh, if you have too many knobs, too many levers, uh, you're going to forget which ones do what. And it becomes uh, very frustrating in the dark to try to figure all that out. I prefer small knobs over long levers. And the reason is because you are, or you could be working in very tight quarters. You could be at a national park. And I don't know if you've been to one of those lately, there's always a whole bunch of people there, you know, doing night nice sky photography. So you're gonna have a lim limited space. Levers tend to stick out. And as you're trying to, you know, move around or about, you might, bump those and, uh, you know, ruin your exposure. So I, once again, as few controls as possible and uh, the, the um, controls, in my opinion, as small as possible as well. Um, and there are many, many different choices out there. So what do you do to prep? Well, you make sure that uh, you have a checklist and, uh, you know, make sure you have enough batteries. Remember, in cold environments, your batteries last, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they uh, get exhausted quicker. Um, if you want your batteries to last a little bit longer, uh, take that battery, uh, that spare battery or batteries that you have, and then put them in your coat pocket close to your body. Keep them warm so that they don't exhaust. Uh, memory cards, make sure you have enough of those. Once again, uh, they're very inexpensive now. Tripod, uh, do your research. Make sure you have a nice, sturdy tripod. Cable release, um, if you don't have one, maybe the... Uh, <laughs> the camera doesn't have that as an accessory, what you can do is you can use the self timer mode on your camera and do it that way. And if you're doing night sky photography, you're gonna get there early, you're probably gonna get hungry. So make sure you pack enough water, some snacks, uh, glow sticks, uh, very, very handy if you're hiking out uh, in the middle of nowhere. A couple years ago, Erica and, uh, uh, and Damon did a, a night sky photography workshop out in White Sands, New Mexico. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever been there, but you can get lost very, very easily. You can walk for miles in the wrong direction and never even know it. So glow sticks are very useful in this case because you can drop them as you head out and now it gives you a path uh, to get back to your uh, car. Uh, if you are going to be doing night nice sky photography in different parts of the country, well, the weather is going to vary. So dress in layers, make sure you, uh, you know, bring some warm gloves. I prefer those photography gloves uh, that uh, allow you to access your camera's control. Basically, your index finger, uh, the tip of the glove just peels off and now you can have your, your finger and your thumbs uh, free to, uh, you know, set your camera's controls. And of course, you know, uh, you know, just comfortable shoes uh, as well. So once again, uh, there are many, many different apps out there to help you with your endeavors in night sky photography, uh, dark sky photography, whatever it is that you're going to do. Um, look for those and, uh, you know, download your favorites. Uh, PhotoPills is probably one of the best apps out there, but you do have to pay for it. Uh, there's, a, there's a Sky Guide, Night Walk. I mean, there's many, many different ones out there. There's also applications out there that gives you uh, the time of uh, golden hour, blue hour, twilight, so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, look into those as well. Uh, those are very, very handy when you're trying to figure things out. So uh, a night sky photography app, for example, you are there in that uh, place during the day, you open up your app and it shows you a map of the uh, night sky, uh, what it's gonna look like at a certain time uh, or later that evening. Any questions? Thank you so much, Armando. Okay. Um, I think we had a few questions. Um, so there was a slide about halfway through that was um, tips for framing the photos. Do you think you oh. could, do you, know the, do you know that slide? Do you think you could go back to that and speak to that one more time? Okay, let's see. This one? I'm not, I don't know exactly which one. Um, it was like when you were talking about tips for framing photos. Um, it was after the star trails. That's not here. And that's more towards the beginning right there. I think, sorry, I mean, we're trying to <laughs> figure out where this is. They said it was after the Star Trails one. After the Star Trail ones. Yeah. That one? Maybe in here, I think. Oh, that one, that's what they said. There you go. Yeah, okay, so basically, uh, you know, a few of the tips here is, you know, think about the composition. You're looking through the viewfinder um, and think about what your main subject is. Uh, try to place, you know, use the rule of thirds and try to place it in one of the PowerPoints. Um, maybe there's something uh, around the subject that you can use uh, to frame uh, uh -huh. your, your subject. So you can use that framing as a, a focal point. Uh, maybe you can add scale. Uh, if there's a subject around, maybe a mountain, a tree or something, maybe you can use that as scale. Uh, decide whether or not you're, this is going to be a black and white or a color image. Uh, once again, I shoot in raw, I always shoot in color and desaturate later. Uh, but I am thinking and looking at the image and I decide when I press the button if this is in fact going to be a black and white or not. And now perspective is, uh, you know, do you shoot from a low angle? Do you shoot from a high angle? Uh, you know, think about that because that actually uh, does change the way your image looks as well. Uh, once again, uh, it really depends on the subject matter and what you're photographing. 
that will determine this. Uh, a wide angle lens from a low perspective uh, with a subject that's pretty close uh, makes it appear larger than it really is. So. Cool. We had another question. Um, Mary Jo asks, how would you set the camera to preserve the color of the rising moon? Okay. That is uh, the sunny 16 rule. And basically, uh, start at F16. Uh, start at a very low ISO, 100, if that's the native ISO on your camera. If it's 200, then start with that. And then your shutter speed is going to be equal or close to whatever the ISO is. So if it's 200 ISO, then you're going to be at about a 200th of a second or 250th, somewhere around there. And once again, that is a starting point. It depends on how high the moon is uh, over the horizon. It depends on what part of the country you are as well. Uh, set up, take your first shot, determine whether it is uh, too bright or too dark, and then you're going to be, uh, you're going to change your shutter speed accordingly. Um, the aperture, you're going to want as much depth of field as possible because even though you're photographing the moon, it is pretty far away. Your depth of field is pretty shallow, so you're going to want as much depth of field as possible. I would say F11, F16 is where I would start. And then once again, what I'm going to be doing is dropping my shutter speed or increasing my shutter speed uh, to either lighten or darken my image. Very cool. Um, are there any other questions? We definitely have some time. What would be your settings for a full bright moon? Um, sunny 16 rule. Uh, in fact, we had a very bright moon out yesterday and because of the wildfires, uh, it was like a very yellowish, almost orangish color and I wanted to preserve that color. So what I did is uh, I took my 150 to 600 lens mounted it on a crop sensor camera. Why did I do that? Because I wanted to include the fo uh, increase the focal length. 1.5 magnification on a 600 gives me a 900 millimeter. Makes the moon larger in my viewfinder. So that's why that choice. Uh, I started at F16, uh, 100 ISO, and I started with a shutter speed of uh, uh, 1 25th of a second. The moon was pretty low in the horizon, so my picture I thought was a little bit dark. So what I did is I slowed down my shutter speed. And that's how I, uh, once again, set the, um, um, you know, set the exposure. Uh, white balance, I actually, um, you know, shot a few images in auto white balance, and then I personally change my white balance to uh, the cloudy, you know, that cloudy uh, setting or the uh, overcast uh, setting and then the, sh the uh, open shade setting uh, to once again, preserve the color that I was looking at. Auto ISO tend to, tended to make the, um, the white balance setting a little um, uh, cooler than it really was. So uh, once again, your white balance is gonna preserve the color and then your uh, exposure, uh, if you're controlling your shutter speed, then your shutter speed is gonna control the density of the image. Uh, Charles asked, uh, what app did you use to discover where the Milky Way, Milky Way is in the sky? And I think uh, you had a slide where there are a few, a few different apps, yes, right? Yes, yes. Um, I, I, let's see, I personally have, uh, in my uh, phone here, Sky, uh, excuse me, Star Walk 2. There's Sky Guide, there's Sky View, there's quite a few of them. I would say download them one at a time, play with it and see which one is going to suit your needs the best. But there's, there's a lot of choices out there. If you don't mind paying for something that gives you a lot of detail or a lot of information, then Photo Pills uh, would be the one. I believe it's a $12 a year um, you know, service for that, but you can actually type in coordinates like, um, you know, GPS coordinates on the uh, app and it'll tell you where the Milky Way is, in what position, what direction, uh, 
in 2021, June 30th, <laughs> or whatever you put in. So yeah, that one's a little more intensive than the other ones that are free, because the ones that are free, you have to be there during mm -hmm. the day so that you can see where it's going to be. The other one will give you a future shot in a place that you've never been. So there you go. Yeah, I think I use the, I have Sky Guide, which I, I think is free. And it definitely gets the job done if you're just heading out shooting yeah. and you want to understand where something is. It's very helpful. So. Yeah, usually the, these apps, if you want to get rid of the uh, advertising, you have to pay a couple bucks. But it's well worth it, especially if you're out there. You don't, you don't want to mess with, uh, okay, I got to go through this ad while I'm trying to set up. <laughs> For sure. All righty. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I think we're good. So I just want to say thank you so much, Armando. This was awesome. Uh, I hope everyone has taken something away and learned quite a bit from this. Um, and just to remind you all, we have one last webinar coming up at 4 p.m. And it is with our image master, Jonathan Thorpe. He's doing a live shoot on camera. Um, so you're going to feel like you're standing behind him on the set watching. It's going to be really, really cool. Um, I hope you can make it. So yeah, thank you all so much. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone for, uh, you know, giving us time. Of course. Hi, everybody.